and I have a great pleasure to welcome you at the second webinar of Eurobloodnet's Topic on Focus, Cutaneous Lymphoma program. And also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please write it in the chat with a cloud symbol. And also, if you would like to participate in the discussion at the end of the uh, webinar, also please write your questions there in the chat. And uh, please welcome with me Professor Dr. Martin Werner, who will lead uh, for us a very interesting presentation today on mycosis fungoidae. Professor Werner is currently the head of dermatology department at the Leiden University Medical Center. And before his um, career as a clinician, uh, Professor Werner uh, worked in the field of immunology and microbiology in Miami. Uh, Professor Vermeer's research and clinical work focuses on cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and cutaneous lymphoma patient care. Uh, his research activities concentrate on clinical pathological studies, genomic analysis of alterations in cutaneous lymphoma tumor cells, and international studies on developing diagnostic markers. Professor Vermeer received clinical fellowships and VD grants from Dutch Health Council. And among many achievements, uh, Professor Vermeer leads translational research of the EORCC Cutaneous Lymphoma Working Group and the Cutaneous Lymphoma International Consortium. Uh, Professor Vermeer, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction and a good effort. Uh, afternoon to everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, give this second webinar, which is dedicated to mycosis fungoides. And first, let's give a very short recapitulation of the last webinar, which was held by Professor Willemsen on cutaneous lymphoma in general. These are lymphoma that present in the skin, and at time of presentation, no extracutaneous localizations are present. Multiple types of skin lymphoma that differ greatly in clinical presentation and in clinical behavior exist. Now there is a classification dedicated to cutaneous lymphoma and clinical pathologic correlation is essential to make a correct diagnosis. Now that we know this, let's turn our attention to mycosis fungoides. After this webinar, attendees should be familiar with the different types of skin lesion in mycosis fungoides progression and survival characteristics in different stages of disease, and the therapeutic approach in different stages of mycosis fungoides. As a first slide, mycosis fungoides is the most common type of CTCL. Around 50% of cutaneous lymphoma are patients with mycosis fungoides. And there's a preferential localization of skin lesions on the nates, so on the buttocks, and other shielded areas of skin. And in general, mycosis fungoides patients have a very indolent disease course from years or even decades with a very slow progression from patches to plaques and to tumors. And I'll show some example of this progression of disease later in my presentation. Development of nodal or visceral disease is only found in a minority of patients, but it can develop. And so we always should be very, uh, take very much care of this. The 10 year overall survival and disease specific survival is 62 and 71% for the whole group. But as you will see, the stage of disease um, has a huge impact on this. And this is very dry information. So what does it look like in a patient? And this is a clinical case that illustrates the different types of skin lesion, but also the disease progression that takes place. So initially, this patient presented with patches on the buttocks that you can see here, that were not so very sharply demarcated, some erythema, some atrophy uh, uh, was present with a very fine, uh, small lines uh, in, in these lesions, and 
Initially, it was thought that this was an eczema and the patient was treated with a local corticosteroid. Later on, he progressed to more extensive lesions. And what you can see here is that these are relatively monomorphic, erythematous, sharply demarcated, round or even angular plaques that are uh, generalized over the whole body. At that point in time, uh, the diagnosis mycosis fungorius was made, and it was started with light therapy that I'll come to back later in this presentation as well, with initially some good effect. However, a few years later, he developed this exophytic and slightly erosive tumor on the right shoulder. So in one patient, you see the different stages of disease for a mycosis fungoides. And it's important to uh, look to pay attention to this clinical presentation and try to quantify the type of lesions that you see, because the type of lesions that are present in a patient determines what kind of skin stage a patient has. So in this patient to the left with the two buttocks, the patches and plaques are less than 10% of the skin, and this is a T1 or a 1A patient. The patient in the middle has patches and plaques more than 10% of the skin and the T2 or 1B. And to the right, in the right panel, the frank tumors have developed and this is a T3 or 2B patient. And this type of skin lesions and extent of skin lesions correlates closely with the progression. Because progression to systemic disease in the patient on the left is 5%, in the middle uh, patient is 15%, and in only in tumor stage, it increases to 40%. And with that, the 10-year survival correlates closely as well. So in the first patient, and also in the second patient, the 10-year survival is pretty good. But it's only in tumor stage that your 10-year survival drops down to around 40%. And this is also shown in, uh, in, in this slide. And the stage-specific survival that I just described in the previous slide has also been observed in several independent large patient cohorts, both in Europe and also in the United States. And this particular example is from a study by Kim that was published in 2003. So the patients in 1A have a very, very good survival. And it's only that in patients with 2B, so the tumor stage disease, that you really see this very detrimental uh, disease course. Given the fact that apart from a stem cell transplantation, there is no curative option available in the large majority of patients, therapy is given as a palliative treatment aimed at complete remission or uh, aimed at management of disease. In MF, which is limited to the skin, we can use skin-directed therapies, and the type of skin-directed therapy is adjusted to the type and the extent of skin lesions patch, plaques, or tumors, as I just demonstrated. Only if nodal or visceral involvement develops, then systemic therapy, which can be combined or followed by skin-directed therapy, is indicated. Staging is not indicated in these early stage disease, but only if additional uh, symptoms develop or if uh, palpable lymph nodes are found at physical examination. It should be noted that early aggressive treatment with intensive chemotherapy does not improve the prognosis. And this is already a very old literature reference, but no similar uh, studies have been performed since. So we still have to refer to this uh, publication from uh, 1989. So what can we do in patients that present with patches and plaques? One of the treatments that we give to many patients is local steroids. And we have to use the very potent steroids because the less potent ones do not work. We give it once a day for four to seven times a week. For more extensive lesions, so for the 1B patients, phototherapy with PUVA twice or three times a week, which can be given in a normal schedule as is also used in psoriasis or eczema, is an excellent choice. 
and only in exceptional cases maintenance puva once or twice a week is needed. And to be honest, we at the moment we do not have any patients on this regime anymore. Puva can be combined with interferon three times a week in a low dose schedule or with retinoids or the, the last time more and more pegylated interferon. Then a very special one is local chemotherapy with chloromethin gel, which is given once a day, four to seven times a week, can be very attack, uh, effective in extensive uh, patches and plaques. And then phototherapy with narrow band UVB is used only in patients with minimally infiltrated lesions, because as soon as these uh, plaques become more infiltrated, it's not effective anymore. And then you either have to go to a PUVA therapy or local chemotherapy with chloromethin. So this is an, a clinical example of a patient that was presenting with these uh, very, well, not well demarcated erythematous plaques on the buttocks. It was initially treated with topical steroids, later on with phototherapy, in this case narrow band UV, which is uh, understandable because these are very slightly infiltrated plaques. And this, this led to a complete remission, but as is often the case in this disease, later on a relapse developed in the same area. And then either you could uh, do nothing, just to have a wait and see uh, a policy and see if it does, does not uh, spread out very quickly, or if it is one lesion and it's more or less stable for a long time, then you could uh, contemplate to use local low-dose radiotherapy. This is another example of a patient with more extensive disease, and in this case, uh, photochemotherapy with PUVA was chosen, and all, this also led to a complete remission, but later on, after the, uh, the PUVA was stopped, a skin relapse developed that was then controlled more or less effectively with local corticosteroids. And finally, a third example of a patient with extensive patches and plaques that was also treated with, uh, with PUVA, that then led to a complete response. And in this particular patient on the right leg, you can see very uh, beautifully the sharply demarcated and angular on, and gyrated erythematous plaques that are very, very uh, characteristic for mycosis fungoides. Now patients can progress to more extensive and more uh, infiltrated lesions, uh, as is shown in this uh, uh, slide. And then we see MF tumors developing within this erythematous fields. And often they are ulcerating, as is the case here. And also in this patient, multiple tumors are ulcerating. Here, frank tumors are developing. And also here in the groin area and on the foot. And uh, in contrast to these patches and plaques that normally are not very uh, cumbersome for patients. These, these uh, tumors that, uh, that ulcerate are often uh, very uh, difficult and really have an effect on the quality of life. So what are your therapeutic options here? In the case of generalized plaques, more infiltrated plaques that all tend to become tumors, Treatment with PUVA combined with retinoid or, or uh, interferon is a very good choice, also to prevent development of tumors. Uh, however, in those patients where frank tumors have developed, as is shown over here, you really need radiotherapy. And the good news is that local radiotherapy with low-dose radiotherapy, 8 grays, is sufficient in around 90% of the cases. And a very special type of treatment for patients with generalized nodules and tumors is total skin electron beam, and I'll show this a little bit later in this presentation. First, local radiotherapy. As I indicated, 8 gray is really the mainstay of radiotherapy treatment at the moment. Fortunately, we do not see uh, radio resistance in, in these tumors. Also, if relapses develop, this is not the case. And twice four grade that is given in four days is sufficient in the large majority of patients. Only if a relapse develops, then we, in the same area, 
then we use a higher dose of 20 gray, which used to be the standard dose. And it's very attractive to use this low dose because you know this is a chronic disease. Patients will develop multiple tumors also in the future. And we know that the total dose of 60 to 80 gray is considered the upper limited because of cumulative radiotoxicity. So it makes sense to treat with as low dose as possible. And then in addition to the sort of classic local radiotherapy fields, we have developed special fields for uh, such as a total head or a total skin minus the head. We will we'll not go into that any further. Here an example of uh, patients that have been uh, treated with local low-dose radiotherapy for tumors that developed here in the neck, here on the shoulder, very typically here on the buttocks. This is, a, of course, an area that with the PUVA therapy could not be reached. And this is one we should be uh, sort of alert of because sometimes people develop these kind of thicker lesions in the eyelids, which is often uh, caused by um, by the fact that patients during puva treatment use uh, sunglasses that shield the eyelids and therefore these are not treated by that photochemotherapy and then tumors develop at that in that area. Fortunately, treatment with radiotherapy is is possible, and uh, a good radiotherapy center can always uh, find find a way of, of of treating these lesions. Then total skin electron beam. This is a very special type of radiotherapy that is typically uh, given to patients with extensive infiltrated plaques and tumors, such as the patient shown in these three panels. It would be very difficult uh, to treat all these skin lesions with different uh, uh, fields of radiotherapy, but now with total skin electron beam you can treat the entire skin. Until recently, a total dose of 35 gray was always given, sort of the classic total skin, and now much lower doses, around 12 gray, uh, are, have been pioneered with a, a, a reasonably good success. And again, this is very nice because you then keep your cumulative toxicity low. Patients have to go, uh, are irradiated, irradiated typically two times to three times a week, and for a duration to six to ten weeks. So it's quite an intensive treatment for patients to follow. This is an, uh, a picture of uh, how the ra radiation source is positioned. This is where the patient is standing in a frame such as here. So it's quite a distance, but you need it to have a broad beam of uh, electron uh, therapy. And um, the patient, by positioning the patient in a series of poses, that are designed so that the entire skin is exposed, it is possible to give the entire skin uh, radiation therapy. And this is a clinical example of a patient that was treated with a total skin electron beam. And um, this is typically a patient with these thick infiltrated plaques, tumors developing here and here and here. This cannot be treated with PUVA, uh, anymore, if you would treat with uh, areas uh, only with areas with, with radiotherapy, that would be uh, not efficient enough. And in this case, in this type of patient, total skin is a very uh, good therapeutic option. Having said that, also after total skin, this patient is not cured, and it will only be a matter of time that new lesions will develop. And uh, after a few month or, or half a year, you will end up more or less in the same uh, very difficult situation. So it's a good idea to treat these patients in um, not only in uh, combination with your radiation oncologist, but also with your hemato-oncologist and discuss if after uh, this intensive radiation treatment, it is possible to follow this up with chemotherapy and and, and explore together if there's a possibility to, uh, to give this patient a stem cell transplant. So these clinical examples, the combination of these clinical examples, illustrate how patients with skin-limited mycosis fungoides 
can be treated with skin directed therapies, starting with steroids, ending with intensive radiotherapy, and that these patients should not be treated with systemic chemotherapy, not for the initial lesions, but also not for relapsing tumor stage disease. Now we switch to higher uh, stages of disease, because in a small proportion of patients, progression of disease develops with overt nodal or visceral disease, or in those cases with widespread tumors that are not responsive anymore to skin-targeted therapies or cannot be handled with skin-targeted therapies, then we have to think about treating these patients with systemic chemotherapy. Fortunately enough, this is only a small proportion of your total number of patients, around 15%. Traditionally, uh, these patients were treated with CHOP, but more and more there is a reluctance to use this because this therapy induces a lot of immunosuppression and is also not the definite answer to this disease. There are an increased number of new treatment modalities, so new alternatives for CHOP, but the exact type in the treatment of MF is, has still to be defined. And this is an overview of relative recent therapeutic development. So some new cytotoxic, or relative new cytotoxic drugs that we can now use in this disease. HDAC inhibitors such as forinostat, romidepsin, panavinostat, and new antibodies against CD52, CD30, and CCR4. And finally, a few words uh, on allogenic stem cell transplantation. But before we turn our attention to this, first, a few words on a particular type of mycosis fungoides that needs mentioning. And that's folliculotropic mycosis fungoides. In these patients, uh, we see a preferential involvement of the head and neck with follicular papules, plaques, and tumors that lead to alopecia, which can be seen in the eyebrow of these patients. It's complicated by severe pruritus and frequent secondary bacterial infections. The reasons to single this disease out is that it's less responsive to skin-directed therapies and has a less favorable prognosis than classic MF with a 5-year survival around 74% and a 10-year survival around 25%. It's also reflected in this uh, survival curve that shows that your follicular MF, the blue line, follows more or less the line for MF tumors. And therefore it makes sense to treat these uh, patients with a, with a more aggressive therapeutic approach similar to MF tumor stage. So with local chemotherapy, for instance, PUVA with retinoids and interferon, as you have seen before, followed by local radiotherapy or skin electron beam. And you can imagine in these patients with extensive tumor formation on the scalp, on the uh, cheeks, and also on the chin, a huge tumor, that uh, at the early, at the first presentation, you already have a discussion Yes, we can treat him with total skin electron beam, which in fact was the thing we did with success, but we already had to discuss also the possibilities to follow that up with the LOSCT. This is a more subtle clinical presentation with a sort of moth-eaten alopecia on the scalp. In the neck, there's a lot of alopecia, and in closer examination, you see follicular accentuation. Same thing in this patient again, there is the loss of the uh, uh, eyebrows here and an accentuation of your hair follicles is seen, or, uh, the follicular accentuation is seen on the legs. So now in these patients, as in MF tumor stage, allogenic stem cell transplantation is an option because uh, this can result in a complete and durable remission and could be considered in relative young patients with advanced disease. Previous studies showed us uh, that a graft versus lymphoma effect can be uh, initiated and donor lymphocyte infusions can be effective. However, complications including toxicity and graft versus host disease 
and recurrence of disease lead to a two-year overall survival around 50%. And at present, we do not have uh, randomized, randomized controlled trials, and there's no standard of care. So the things to, that needs to be resolved are an optimal conditioning regime, optimal donor selection, optimal patient selection, and optimal timing in disease scores. And I think the new um, therapeutic modalities that I showed to you earlier in this presentation, combined with the um, new ways to, to perform an allogenic stem cell transplantation, should make it possible to make this a, a, a better therapeutic option for these patients. And prospective multicenter trials, or at least collaboration between centers, are very, very welcome to uh, to optimize this this uh, treatment modality. Finally, an overview of some recent guidelines that describe the therapeutic approach in MF patients in more detail, including the ESMO, the EORTC, and the UK cutaneous lymphoma group. The take-home messages from this presentation are, in MF confined to the skin, the extent and the type of skin lesions correlate with prognosis. Skin-limited mycosis fungoides, so stage 1a to 2b, can be treated with skin-directed therapies. The type and extent of skin lesions determines the type of skin-directed therapies. An increasing number of treatment modalities for patients with systemic disease are present now but the exact place in the treatment is still to be defined. And with that, we've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vermeer, for, for this uh, comprehensive presentation. And as I can see, um, in the chat, there is a first question. So we have two questions already. There's ongoing discussion among dermatologists that MF is an early stage of sensory syndrome with blood involved. What is your opinion on this? Yeah, so my opinion on this is that uh, um, mycosis fungoides and sensory syndrome are really two different um, diseases. And the reason to, to uh, think so are that it, I just showed you the stepwise uh, uh, development of um, uh, mycosis fungoides, but in fact, during that stepwise development, an erythroderma can develop. However, that's a very exceptional uh, development, so only few cases are, are seen. And in those cases, there is a slow increase on, of your tumor cells in, in, in blood. Having said that, with time, those cases can, in the end, fulfill the clinical criteria for, for uh, as are laid down for Cesare syndrome. In contrast, patients with Cesare syndrome, they start with the tumor cells in blood. So basically, it's a leukemia, and you can even see, these are exceptional patients, but you can see patients that have a large number of tumor cells in blood without any uh, skin uh, involvement. So without erythema or, or other uh, uh, skin um, lesions that develop then later in the disease course. Um, so these are two clinical observations, and the other one is it, you, uh, also if you look at the histology, it can be slightly different, and there are more and more molecular markers now that also uh, all point to a, a, a different uh, cell of origin. Uh, and to simplify it a bit, it, it, it's thought that um, Cesare syndrome is a, a sort of circulating memory T cell whereas in mycosis and goas, we are dealing with a resident memory T cell in skin. So I hope that answers the first question, but you're right, it's an ongoing debate, and um, it will be so for some time. Blood, blood involvement criteria, which are set for CD4 positive disease, also apply for CD8 mycosis and goas. Yeah, so uh, we can... Uh, see uh, CD8 positive cases of mycosis fungoides. This is a minority of cases, around 10%. And in fact, the, the same criteria that are used for a blood involvement are, are used in these cases. But then you're 
really talking about a really, really exceptional patient. So a CD8 positive MF is already a minority. And then patients with a CD8 positive MF developing a sizable blood involvement would be a very, very rare case. To what extent do you perform TCR clonality analysis in MF workshop? We do use it in particular in though as an adjunct diagnostic criterion. So in some cases that where it's very easy to make a diagnosis, the, the uh, additional value for TCR clonality is low. Sometimes if you, you struggle with the diagnosis and you're, you're not sure, then TCR clonality can help you, especially if you have TCR clonality from different lesions that all show the same T-cell clone. That would be a very strong argument for a malignancy. But please realize that also in long-standing inflammatory disease, such as uh, lichen sclerosis or eczema or psoriasis, you can detect clones. So clonality is not the same as malignancy. Not in other body sites, but also not in skin. When diagnosing Cesare syndrome, do you always look for related clone in blood and skin? And the answer is yes. And this will be, uh, be discussed more extensively by Martin Bago in the next webinar. Do you always perform clonality tests in lymph node biopsies? Uh, not always, I think it is uh, performed in those cases where you have a clinical question attached to it. Um, do you always prefer to do it? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, what is the role for total skin electron beam radiotherapy in the pre-treatment of patients selected for allogenic stem cell transplantation? Thank you very much for that very good question. Other questions were also very good, of course, but this is one that we are... Um, um, it is very, um, I say, we're very busy with this one. It, the, in the, the newer transplantation protocols, a total skin electron beam is positioned before stem cell transplantation with the idea of making the skin as uh, most as you can uh, devoid of your tumor cells. And I think it's a very, very good approach. And that, that's in fact the approach that we are adopting now. It has been used for a longer time, uh, a much longer time in Stanford. That was that was the uh, center that uh, designed and developed this protocol. And I know it has it is currently also in use in uh, London, in Birmingham, and I think also in Paris. And uh, although no uh, uh, trials have been performed to compare it, it's, it seems to be have a very a good, a, a good additional value. What would be a perfect candidate for allo transplant and even more early transplant? Very good question again. Um, what's your typical conditioning regime? Um, the perfect candidate would be a relative young patient that has uh, that you have already. Um, singled out as having aggressive disease and uh, some time ago we looked at patients that had tumor stage MF and we quantified how many tumors developed and how rapidly they developed we found out that patients that had more than six tumors developing within half a year they had a very high chance of developing systemic disease so that those patients that have very quickly recurring uh, tumors in skin and are very uh, have a high risk of developing systemic treatment and are relatively young that that would be the perfect candidate typical conditioning regime um, I cannot really comment on this one that that's something for the hematologist I would say in stage 1a 1b with systemic progression do you see a progression of the skin into tumors lesions after some time or do they stay patches and plaques um, they uh, typically you would see um, also a development of more tumorous lesions and then later on also systemic lesions so again 
uh, paying close attention to what the skin lesions look like gives you, gives you a lot of information and also for the risk of uh, progression. At what point of the, the um, at what point of the disease do you think it is reasonable to make staging studies, flow cytometry, PET CT, etc.? That's uh, uh, again a, an excellent question. It has been uh, established, and you can find this in all the, all the guidelines that it's uh, not necessary to perform staging procedures in early stage disease. So pa patients presenting with patches and plaques. Uh, and that are otherwise completely healthy, have no uh, complaints or issues at all, and no palpable lymph nodes, then there is no added value for CTs or, 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 or other uh, staging procedures. As soon as you uh, patients develop tumors, I think we, we really should pay very good attention to, uh, to lymph nodes and ask them if they have any complaints, and uh, if they do, then act accordingly. What is your experience using topical retinoids, such as topical bacterotain for early stage MF? Uh, a very good question. Unfortunately, we do not have topical retinoids in the Netherlands, so I have no experience with this. I do have experience with topical uh, mustine, so the, 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 the daga that is now becoming available in the Netherlands. I think that's a very, very uh, a good drug. And it's interesting, I think, because it shows you that by application of a cytotoxic drug on the skin, it can um, penetrate sufficiently to get to the tumor cells, kill the tumor cells, without giving so much uh, um, li limiting toxicity in the skin. So it's, it's very intriguing that it works so well. Is it reasonable to use brentuximab in CD30 negative um, patients? Uh, I find that a difficult one because the issue here is that we uh, do not really uh, know um, how to define CD30 negative patients. And uh, in the beginning, uh, when brentuximab was introduced i think it was very made it made a lot of sense it was very reasonable to to take those patients with a high uh, number of tumor cells expressing cd30 already then it was observed that in some patients with only only a limited number of cd30 positive cells we we did see some therapeutic effect and then also the the system that people use to detect cd30 is something that's that's uh, of interest, and also what do you consider a CD30 positive or a CD30 negative case? So I think this is one area that we really have to uh, develop a little bit further. Then the next question is, to do you perform TBET and GATA3 immunohistochemical stainings in MF work, uh, workup in cases to make the differential diagnosis with dermatitis? No, in fact, we don't. We uh, have the uh, immunohistochemical workup consists of T cell markers, CD3, CD4, CD7, uh, CD8, and uh, we look at the architecture, the atypia, and loss of the normal uh, the T cell markers, but we do not use TBET and GATA3. Even though in the beginning there are few lesions, is mycosis phencoides a systemic disease from the outset? That's again a, an excellent question. I think it is. And uh, the reasons to believe that is that from the beginning, where pa patients have few lesions, they can have, let's say, one or two lesions on the left buttock and one on the right buttock and one, and one on the arm. And it doesn't make sense that a tumor cell would crawl through the skin to get from the one body region to the other. So I think already in a very early stage of disease, the tumor cells or a very low number of tumor cells are circulating through the blood, then uh, enter the skin, find there they find their uh, environment that they like, and then it becomes possible for them to 
to uh, to divide and to 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 stay there. So yes, I think you should regard it as a systemic disease from the outset, but you do not have to treat it as a systemic disease with systemic chemotherapy from the beginning. What is the relevance of detecting same skin and blood clone in early MF? That's a uh, that's a, an excellent question. Actually, um, uh, we do not see this a lot because this is not in our routine procedures to perform blood cl blood clonality in very uh, early stage disease. But we know from our, uh, recent workshops with the ERTC centers that in some patients. Uh, or in what, some centers that do this on a regular basis, that you can find blood clones, and even you can can you find uh, sometimes a sizable number of tumor cells in peripheral blood. At the moment, we do not know if that uh, these tumor cells that are found in early stage disease, if that it correlates with the uh, prognosis of these patients. I, uh, another question, there are defined sensory cell markers in the blood, are there specific MF markers? Not really, there are some new markers that are uh, being tested, PD-1 and TOX, but there, uh, at present there are not, there's not a, an MF specific marker that you could ask for. So it's a combination of your clinical presentation, the uh, and then the histological um, uh, uh, picture, in, in particular atypia and immunohistochemical stains that show you loss of T cell markers. Dear Professor Vermeer, I've collected one question: Do tumor cells in mycosis virus express CD30 and can it be used as a therapeutic target? Yes, and let's see if we can switch to my presentation again because I have a few slides on this one. So, in mycosis van Gogh, you can see patients with blastic transformation. This is seen in 25% of your tumor stage disease. And then tumor cells express CD30 in around half of your cases. And expression of CD30 is associated with better disease-specific survival. It was already published in 2013. And it's uh, of interest to uh, be familiar with this expression of CD30 because the Alcanza trial uh, showed us that brentuximab fedotin is effective in these patients. And uh, in particular, here I'm most interested in the 2B patients, so the patients with tumor tumors, or even with um, systemic disease, there's an overall response rate of 63% uh, and three uh, complete uh, remissions. So it shows you that CD30 is expressed by tumor cells in MF, especially with um, tumor stage with uh, transformation, and that it can be used as a therapeutic uh, target. Do we need to perform blood tests to detect tumor cells? Yes, that was already uh, also a, a, a little bit the, um, the subject a few questions ago, and I have some slides on this one as well. So um, this is also of interest is of interest to the uh, some uh, to the people that asked a few questions before on the distinction between mycosis phagoides and Cesare syndrome. These are three patients that initially started with patches and plaques. So at that moment, uh, a diagnosis of uh, mycosis fungoides, patch and plaque state could be made, but then rapidly developed an erythroderma. And maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, but these two patients are, have a slightly brownish, but a very coarse skin with very thick folds and infiltrated skin that is that has an erythema from head top to toe. So. These patients have progressed to an erythroderma, and in these patients, the number of circulating tumor cells increases and can be detected, in particular using flow cytometry. Distinction with sensory syndrome is currently based on the clinical history and the histology. 
And with that, in fact, I've given a sort of introduction to the next webinar that will be given by Martin Bago on Cesare syndrome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Werner, and thank you all for the discussion. Maybe there is somebody who still has uh, one last question before before we'll end the session. The last chance. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, uh, taking part in this webinar. I'm, I'm very honored that so many people are uh, uh, listening to this uh, this webinar and. If um, and also uh, thank you very much for all the uh, excellent questions. Thank you. We are also very honored for uh, having you today. And uh, just a few words uh, of information. Uh, please register for um, other uh, webinars. The next one will be the uh, 6th of uh, July. And of course, just to remind you, this program is uh, officially accredited by EBAG. And uh, of course, just um, to, to let you know and encourage you to uh, sign in to our uh, EuroBloodNet newsletter. And please follow us uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to get the newest um, information of different initiatives we work on. Thank you very much, Professor Werner, and uh, see you See you all next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.